Today, we take you to Spain to discover a land as beautiful as it's mysterious. Where the desert of Bardenas Reales will unveil its millennial old secrets. In this symphony of colors and shapes, we will dive into a journey under the sun of the largest desert in Europe, where each step evokes a scene reminiscent of the grandest western. We will then venture into the depths of this arid lands in the village of Cuevas de Argadas, where impressive troglodytic dwellings hide, silent witnesses of the past, where time seems to have stopped over a century ago. Then, like a mirage emerging from the horizon, we will wander through the abandoned village of Esco, frozen in time. Through these different places, we invite you on a journey to the heart of the soul of Bardenas Reales, where poetry blends with the majesty of the landscape to create a unique experience filled with mystery and fascination. Let yourself be enchanted by the magic of this ancestral desert where every breath of wind offers a way to our imagination. We begin our visit with the desert of Bartenas Reales in the Navarre region. Even before entering the natural park, we discover a landscape that seems to emerge out of nowhere in the heart of the Green Kingdom, located 70 kilometers from the Pyrenees. After a brief stop at the Bardenas tourist office, we learned that climbing the slopes and peaks of the formations is prohibited as it risks damaging them. Being a biosphere reserve and natural park, note that many areas of this desert are off limits to the public throughout the year. This is an ecosystem of immense fragility that must be protected. So unlike some visitors, be reasonable and respect the rules to best protect this natural jewel. The fauna and flora of the site are more characteristic of the African continent than the northern Iberian peninsula. It was once a paradise for crocodiles and other turtles. Today, the bushes, scrublands, salt marshes and sparty fields are home to eagles, vultures, owls, bustards, foxes, wildcats, genets, amphibians, and other reptiles. The term Bardenas is believed to be derived from the Aragonese word Pardinas, which refers to the pastures of the Ebro plains. The term reales recalls that this region was once a royal property of Navarre. Thus, Bardenas reales can be translated to royal pastures. Since the Middle Ages, the transhuman roots, known as cañadas, brought nearly 500,000 animals to the desert, and it wasn't until the 20th century that the first cultivated fields appeared. You've probably seen this desert in one of the many films shot there, the most famous being undoubtedly The World is Not Enough, a James Bond film directed by Michael Eptid, starring Pierce Brosnan, released in 1999. Furthermore, the opening scene was filmed in Bilbao, a city we'll explore in one of our upcoming episodes. So if you are interested, 
don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell to be notified. The part set in Kazakhstan in the movie was filmed in the Bardenas desert. And for fans of the TV series Game of Thrones, Bardenas Reales served as a backdrop for some scenes in season 6. Recognized as a biosphere reserve by UNESCO, the Bardenas is a natural park spanning 42,500 hectares with the three distinct zones. El Plano, a vast horizontal plateau located in the northern and western areas, reserved for cultivation. La Negra, on the southern slope, formed by a series of horizontal reliefs covered with pines and bushes. La Blanca, the lowest part of the desert, located between the other two, where erosion is most pronounced. This is where the most spectacular formations, such as Castille de Tierra and Pisquera, can be formed. And it's this area that we are visiting. As soon as we arrive, we feel like we are in a real western landscape. The heat is overwhelming and the sun caresses the majestic silhouettes of the rock formations. But this isn't always the case, as in winter, temperatures range from 2 to 13 degrees Celsius and the best time to visit this place is from May to October, with July and August being the hottest months. Bardenas Reales, with its rock terrain and arid expanses, evokes a sense of untamed freedom where the wandering soul is carried away by the enchanting magic of the Wild West. Before the mid-20th century, only shepherds and farmers frequented the desert. With the arrival of tourism officials and photographers in the 1980s, the desert became increasingly known. So much so that by the mid-1990s, overcrowding the desert forced the Navarre government to create a natural park in 1999. The trails, open to pedestrians and mountain bikes, are former pastoral paths. For cars, there are only two paved roads, one leading to the shooting range and the other being the NA125. As for us, we went with our car and stopped many times to walk and discover these magnificent landscapes.
and we finally arrive to what is certainly the most photographed element of the desert. This geological wonder stands as a testament to the power of natural erosion over millions of years, sculpting the earth into captivating formations that have become a hallmark of the area's unique beauty. Rising dramatically from the arid plains, Castile de Terra resembles a fortress crafted by nature itself. Its sheer cliffs and rugged contours dominate the horizon, commanding attention from those who venture into the vast expanse of Las Bardenas Reales. The name Castile del Terra translates to Earth Castle, aptly capturing the fortress-like appearance of this geological marvel. It has even become the emblem of the national park. At the summit, we notice a cubic stone. It seems that it was actually the pedestal of a statue of the Virgin Mary with the child, which disappeared in 1995. visit is soon coming to an end, but we make one last stop to discover a shepherd's house which still seems to be occupied. And we almost expect to see Clint Eastwood come out, cigar in mouth, cold at his waist, and Winchester in hands. After this incredible visit, we head towards Cuevas de Arguedas. The village is located about 10 km from Bardenas. We are eager to discover the troglodytic dwellings of the village. These are houses that were built at the end of the 19th century. At that time, times were tough. There was little work and wages were low. Acquiring housing was impossible for many residents. Moreover, there was a shortage of rental housing, and in some cases, landlords tried to charge high rents. Faced with this situation, some residents began to dig caves to make their homes. They built them themselves with pickaxes and shovels during periods of little work in the fields. Usually, they started with the kitchen, and then gradually built the rest of the dependencies, and depending on family needs, they dug more rooms. By 1940, there were about 52 caves. In 1965, they were abandoned, and their inhabitants moved to what is now the Venice neighborhood. Once abandoned, they were walled up with the intention of letting them fall into oblivion, as the political regime of the time considered it a shameful episode. But today, the caves remain and are a heritage that reminds us of the way of life of our ancestors. To ensure that these experiences are known to younger generations, in 2012, work began to develop parts of the caves and access. To 
conclude our day, we decide to visit the abandoned village of Esco. Every day is a trial. Every day is a failure. Despite its current state, the history of the village dates back to the Bronze Age and, in its surroundings, remains from the Celtic and Roman periods have been discovered. Every day. To our greatest surprise, it's not completely abandoned and we were fortunate to meet one of the last three inhabitants. I can feel it in the bone. He then told us the story of his village, not without emotions. Take me home. Thus, the history of Esco is closely linked to the construction of the Yezatam, a project dating back to the 1920s when it was designed to achieve several objectives, including hydroelectric power generation, flood control, and water supply for irrigation and surrounding agricultural lands. In 1959, the filling of the Yezatam began. Until then, the inhabitants of Esco lived off agriculture and livestock. The orchards were located on the banks of the Aragon and Esca rivers, fertilized by the floods of both rivers. The area above the road was dedicated to cereal and grape cultivation, and the higher area was intended for livestock, mainly sheep, cows, and a few horses. As you make the, bed. the dam thus submerged the most productive agricultural lands. In 1953, Esco had 253 inhabitants and by 1968 only 78 remained. From that moment on, the village was deserted, leaving only four shepherds behind. The construction of the dam thus led to the relocation of the inhabitants of the villages of Ruestas, Tiarmas and Esco, which were located in the valley. Said, I'll follow you. The cultivated fields and land that supported its inhabitants were submerged when the valley was flooded to form the reservoir. Like the creation of the lake also had collateral effects. Indeed, the state was obliged to purchase forest land in the valley to plant black pine trees to prevent erosion of the dam, which led to the abandonment of eight other villages. In total, there will have been over 8,500 inhabitants forced to leave their homes, including approximately 1,500 initially from the villages of Ruestas, Tiarmas and Esco. So Today, Esco and the other villages are silent remnants of a past, reminding us of the human consequences of engineering projects on local communities and their environment. journey was rich in emotions and fascinating discoveries. As All we can say bed. is that this day of visit offered us an unforgettable experience, blending wonder at nature, respect for human heritage, and compassion for the individual stories that make up the fabric of our collective history. So you must lie. See you soon for new discoveries. <laughs>